have two what I would call two of my major <coughs> teachers or my major gurus or uh, major influences, and that would be Carlos Soares, who uh, lived contemporary with Alvin Boyd Coon. Alvin Boyd Coon lived here in America. Carlos Soares lived in Egypt, was born a uh, Jew, he was born a Jew in France and was educated in London. And uh, he is, he's wrote uh, quite a number of books. Carlos Soares is a prolific Hebrew scholar and he's wrote a lot of books about the ancient Kabbalah and bringing back the true Kabbalah. So both of these are two of the major teachers for me in my life at, at this point, have been for probably 20, 25, 30 years, for, a, for quite a while, okay? So this is a book I want to read uh, from Alvin Boyd Coon. One of Alvin Boyd Coon's books, and I have said this many times, and I will say it continue, the University of Ohio listed Alvin Boyd Coon's book called uh, The Lost Light, that's the title of the book, The Lost Light, it's a thick book, about four or 500 pages, it was given the credit of being the most important work ever put in the English language. That puts it pretty high on it. And that was by the professor, the dean of the University of Ohio back in uh, back a number of years, back in the 60s or 70s, which was when that statement was made. And he wrote that book in, I think, in the 50s, uh, late, early 50s. And Howard Boyd Coon died. Uh, Alvin Boyd Coon's last work that he did, his last book, was entitled A Rebirth for Christianity, which is a profound book. And, uh, but this is one of his books also. This book is probably 500, 400 pages, 400, 400 pages. So I want you to just hear this. Just let this resonate with you, or I pray that it does. He said, God is an ever present associate and help in trouble for every one of his creatures. Every one of them. Okay? By virtue of the fact that he has already taken the measure of placing a unit portion, placing a unit portion, I must emphasize certain things, the unit portions that he's referring to or that I receive are twofold. They are called spirit and soul. And we are, most all of us know that, most people do know that you're tripart being, spirit, soul, and body. Yet, we ignore the eternal essence of our being, our body. We ignore the spirit soul. We pay very little attention to it. We don't even recognize it. And as far as secular society goes, it's basically non-existent. Yet it is the two-thirds of your being that live you, period. And no matter who you are, I mean, I don't care if you're Saddam, Saddam Hussein, Hitler, or Billy Graham, your spirit soul is the major part of that that lives you. And it's also the part that we know very, very little about. And you can't hardly find anything about it in, quote, Christianity. So... When I'm talking and I'm reading this from Alvin Boyd Coon, I want to make certain distinctions. Like when he says the unit portions of itself, he's talking about the unit portions of God itself. Those unit portions are spirit, soul, and soul. Spirit and soul is not the same. They completely have different functions. They have different essences. They have different power, different abilities, different delegations as to what they do. But we don't know that. Most of us have never heard that. Most of us have never been taught that. So, God is an ever-present, our associate, and help in trouble for every one of his creatures by virtue of the fact that he has already taken a measure of placing a unit portion of himself or itself with the whole of his being potentially latent in it. In other words, everything God is, everything God represents, is resident in that portion of itself. Okay? 
within every, within the very organisms of creation or the creature. He has sent his son, and this is a catchy, this does not mean Jesus, okay? When it talks about son, it talks about the spark of itself or himself or God's self. We call it, we are a spark of the great light. That's how it's been said. In other words, we are a fire from the flame of the sun. You can't not be because that's the only way you can live in this dimension. You have to have that fire, that spark, that flame, that portion. Or you can't live. You just can't, you, you can't live at all. And that's called the sun or the seed. So God seeded everything God created with itself. So that seed is in you, and most all it's in all of us, it's in us with potentiality. Okay? If you have questions, just jump in and ask. He has sent his son or his seed or that unit portions of his being to carry out his work in creation. They are of identic nature, one with him, and are in him as he is in them. They are co-substantial with him. Sonship is theirs through the sheer fact that their being seed emanations or generations from God's own body. In other words, what is God's body? God's not a man, but Religions tried to make God a man. Well, what is God? Well, God is power. God is essence. God is the breath you breathe. Just like we were just talking about that. When you inhale, you take all that God is within your being. God is the electricity that electrifies your, your physical body. Your body can't run. With, without God, your body is a cadaver. Your body is a organ or a machine without any life in it. Period. Now you, we do a lot with this machine. And we can do a lot with this machine. But we don't do near what we can with this machine. Okay? Uh, uh, they are indeed his life projected out from unity into multiplicity. As the Greeks so clearly expressed it, God distributes his divine life among all his creatures. Since a creature is such only because a unit of divine life has generated it. The ancient sages, knowing this, held it to be blasphemy against God for man to worship any power outside himself. See them. They, the, I will read that again. The ancient sages, knowing this fact that I've just mentioned, that he said, they thought it was blasphemy against God for man to worship any power outside himself. Now we are taught to worship power outside ourselves, therefore leave ourself powerless and begging this power outside ourself to help ourselves because we can't help ourselves. And so what we have had done to us, we've had ourselves denuded, depowered, so that we are being what we are designed to be. And that's powerful. Why? Because we're filled with all power. So uh, that, the ancient sages knew this. And they held it to be blasphemy against God for man to worship any power outside himself. Christianity has wrecked this magnificent perspective and has stulified or stupefied an enormous percentage of the sincerest efforts of the Occident for 1,600 years by directing man's conscious aspiration for God outside the field of his own area of control. For me, I say, I just shout, yeah, amen, hallelujah. The havoc and the wreckage from this misdirection of serious endeavor in the Western world had is past ability to calculate. Now, to deny the imminent presence of God's own life and mind within the core of man's being 
is flatly to reject the basic teaching of every religion that has inspired the soul of humanity throughout all time. It would be, a, it would be to make meaningless the very name Emmanuel. Y'all know what that means, don't you? Emmanuel, that means God in us or God with us. And they were one person that we thought Emmanuel applied to. And that person we thought lived and died 2,000 years ago. When we are the person of Emmanuel. That's it. So anyway, I want you to go with me to a book. Uh, you'll have to find your index because I'm going to take you through a big Bible drill here. If you can find the book of Ecclesiastes, and uh, Ecclesiastes, um, which is right behind the book of of Psalms, you have Psalms, and then you have Proverbs, and then find you'll find just tucked away right in behind Proverbs, you'll find Ecclesiastes, a little book there, a little powerful book, Ecclesiastes chapter twelve. Then I want you to see what this says in light of what we just read here from out of the Lord. Could Ecclesiastes chapter twelve and verse seven it says then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. And that word dust is afar in Hebrew, and actually the word afar means the particles of life. Light, L-I-G-H-T, because that's what your body is made up of. It's called dust because it's minute particles. That's what it means. It's minute particles. It's, it's so fine. But now today, because of what we're having with biology and science and medicine, we're having the abilities now to see that you are truly a light vessel. And, we, and they know that. They say that even now. And that's what that dust is referring to. That's the light particles. So watch what this is saying. And of course, we see this as the understanding of when we lay the body down. When we lay the physical body down. So verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit, that's ruach, ruach, everybody remember that, or you can say that, say you have to roll your R. Ruach. Can, can y'all roll your R? Ruach. 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 Yeah, y'all can do that real good. Ruach shall return to what? To God. Who gave it? When did God give you that Ruach? Does anybody know when you've got Ruach? Well, you got it twofold. You got it because it came through the seed of your father. It was the very life that was in that seed that gave that seed life to penetrate the egg in your mom. You got that. That was, that was like God invading the material world through that seed. And that is the spark of the seed, sun, light of God that created you and built you. You got that. That's called power, spirit. And then it built in the womb of your mama, it built you as its house, tabernacle, temple. Okay? And then when your mama says it's done, it's finished, and that baby began to stir, it began to point itself to that place of the, of the, it was in a tomb, in the womb, the womb and the tomb are the same thing, it began to point itself to the door, to the opening of the tomb, womb, so that it could enter into this dimension called the physical world. And when it did, what's the very first thing that happened to it? <laughs> first thing. It did what? It inhaled. It did not exhale. It inhaled. It, what does it do when it does it? What do you do when you, when you draw in? You draw in the air. You draw in Ruach, the spirit. And so what happens as the very last thing when you get rid of your physical body, are you ready to lay your body down or take your body off? Instead of going in, you do what? Excellent. And what did they say? They gave a word for that. He expired. She expired. Which is a better word for saying they died. Because the use of die, dead, and death is completely misunderstood. Because what happened, you just released the life that liked you for all of the period of time that you lived. And that life that liked you was God. So I don't care who you are, you have to be filled with God to breathe in this dimension. 
And so we don't know anything about that. We're not associated with that. We haven't been taught enough about that to, uh, to abreast ourselves of the knowledge of what I have and what I am. But that's clear in that passage of Scripture right there. And I want you to, that word right there, spirit, it's amazing how they do these things in the English or, or King James or, or translations. They take that word spirit and you notice it's a little s so you don't think much of it. You think, oh well, it's just my spirit. Like your spirit's not God's spirit. Because you see, there is just spirit. <laughs> There's not your spirit and God's spirit. You think, well, my spirit is, I have a wicked spirit. I have a mean spirit. I have a, I have a, I have a, no, whatever spirit you got, it's the spirit of God. It's the same spirit. That word spirit right there is the same word in Genesis 1. Well, a matter of fact, real quick, go to Genesis 1 7. I know you can find that real easy. Let me just show you something. I'll show you kind of how they do this in Scripture. Genesis 1 7. And it says, verse 2, Genesis 1 7. I mean, Genesis 1 2. I said 1 7. I'm sorry. 1 2. Genesis 1 2, it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit. See it there, it's a big S. That's the same word, Ruach. So there, there it's the spirit of what? It's the spirit of God. It is God. Now I want to show you something else they do with translations. Look at Genesis chapter 6. This is a, one of the most misunderstood phenomenal stories in the Bible, and that's the story of Noah. And a lot of corruption in the translations of this story of Noah. But right here is just one of them. And I want you to look at it here in Genesis 6 and verse 17. And of course, I guess you're all looking at the King James translation. Anybody got a translation that's not a King James? No? Alright, look at Genesis 1 17. It says, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. Wherein is the, what's the word? Brethren. That's the word ruach. It's the same identical word in Hebrew that we just got through reading in verse 2 of chapter 1, ruach, spirit of God. So look what he said. He said he's put the spirit of God through the breath. You see the association there? I mean, that's a good association. There's nothing wrong with that to call it breath or to call it spirit. But for you to recognize that it's God, it's greater for you and me. To realize my breath is God. And I can associate it that way. Because it's used that way. But mostly Ruach is referring to spirit. Even though it can be called breath. So here he's saying, look at this. He said, and behold, even I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth. Now, the understanding, if we break this down into the ancient Hebrew and we get a clearer understanding of what he's saying. He's saying the flood is called a deluge. A deluge really is referring to the mass of the physical body because the physical body is built with this Hebrew word. I, we'll put this word up here. Sheen, mim. Let me draw it in two different colors. And that way it, uh, I can, it's just, it's translated one, one word, yod, mim. Now, in Hebrew, there are 22 characters in the Hebrew alphabet with an additional five to give it 27. Those 22 characters is what builds the basic root of the, of the Hebrew alphabet. But here's the, here's the catch. It's, a, it's, a, it's called an alphabet because to try to communicate it, you add vowel points in it. Five or seven, okay? The same thing's true with what I'm doing right now in Southern English. I don't speak good English, but I do speak Southern. <laughs> Whatever that is. Southern Hebrew, too. So, I had a lady from New York who was a Hebrew teacher. She said, I just love your Southern Hebrew. <laughs> okay, thank you. Anyway, uh, so in Hebrew, it's actually called codes, signs and symbols. Now, in English, we have how many characters to make the English alphabet. We have what, 26? We have 26 characters. And what we do with those characters is we jumble them characters together and we make words and therefore we create speech. And so I'm communicating to you through speech and it's symbols. Everything I'm saying is based off symbols. And if I'm doing the same thing with Hebrew, it's symbols. But in Hebrew, the symbols are all coded. 
And by that I said to mean every symbol in the Hebrew alphabet, 22 or the five finals, 27, every one of them has a depth and meaning of the divine purpose. Y'all follow this okay? Mm -hmm. So this particular word, actually in Hebrew, uh, here, I'm sure you know this word here, this is the first sentence in the Bible. By Rashid, that's the first three words. By Rashid in the beginning. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created Bara. And the word Bara is the root for the word son or child or seed. And you have to see all that. You see, in Genesis chapter 1 is the capsule of the entire book. And if we could get Genesis chapter 1, if we could get the capsule right, if we could get the seed right, we would get the book right. Otherwise, we've screwed the book up and don't even know what the book means. So, Barashit, Bara Elohim in et Shamayim. This word is heaven. Now, what have they done with heaven? They, they projected heaven. Where at? In the sky. Somewhere out yonder, right? It's somewhere in the sky. But uh, actually, heaven is really not somewhere up in the sky. Heaven is right here. This is, in Hebrew, this is Sheen Mim. And this is Yod Mim. Now, how do I get this? Now, of course, this is what I call my stick man. This is the, the stick man, which is you. You have to, you have to realize he, this, is a, this is you. This is your endocrine system building the physical body in the womb of your mom. So this is you. Shin mim, here's what this word means. And it's used this way in Genesis 1, chapter 1, because it's where it's the basis of everything that's here. It's the basis of what you're made up of. You know whether you want to say you're made up of 80%, that's old, old science, old, old school mentality, or you're made up of nearly 100% water liquid. You're a, you're a water liquid base. We just are. So this word... Sheen mim is referring to the waters below. Actually, uh, yeah, the waters below. And this yod mim are referring to the waters above. How many of you ever heard that phrase? Waters above and waters below. What do you think of when you hear that phrase? Probably here's what you think of. You think of waters below, salt water. The mass, that's the mass. The greatest portion of liquid on this earth, right, is salt water, which is the same thing as your blood. Your blood in a saline solution, which is salt water, is basically made up of exactly the same thing. I have a question. You got below up there with the sheen. And I, yeah, the, I, I, I know. Exactly. Yeah, I'm glad you caught that. But, and that's how it goes. <laughs> I'll show you. It seems, it's, it seems kind of contradictory, but it's not. It, it, the waters below, which is the sheen, which is the it has a 300 value, it's what's referred to as the breath. And the mem, which has a 40 value, it's referring to the material, the, uh, the uh, physical aspect. The yod, which has a 10 value, it refers to... Uh, it refers to the divine design or divine or the, uh, the timeless in time. And the reason it does, it has this, it's, it's that right there. It's 10. And a computer don't it? That's how a computer works. Everything in a computer is based off that. That's how everything works. That's a phallic, that's a woman. That's a man, that's a woman. Everything in this dimension is built on that right there. In this dimension. Okay? The sheen, that's the breath. That's the divine dimension. So this dimension has that yod, mim, 
And that mem gives it a 600 value. It incorporates the 6, which the 6 always refers to the physical, but has it has three characters, 600. Then it also has the divine aspect of its being. And so the reason I put these this way is the divine spirit or breath that you breathe that builds the whole physical body because it's not just part of the body. I divided it here to give you a concept of the waters above and the waters below or the waters below and the waters above to get you an understanding that that's what Genesis 1 is referring to. When it says heaven, it's not talking about a place out there. It's talking about you. It's talking about our physical body. We don't get that. Where's God at? God's in heaven. Where is heaven? It's my physical body. Is that real complicated? I know it makes the brain stretch. I know you have to, you have to really think. Well, look at this passage here in Genesis 6 again. Verse 17, Behold, I, even I, do bring a flood. That's a deluge upon the waters. That's what he's referring to is the, the mass of the physical body. The mass of the physical body is filled with it. Sensation It's filled with feelings. It's filled with this. And those feelings can be wonderful and those feelings can be horrible. And most of the time for us, they're horrible. Why? Because we're pulled by the sensations of this physical body and this physical world. That's not right or wrong. It's because we have not awakened or raised up or restored or redeemed or carried ourselves through the salvation that's rightfully ours. In other words, to take back control of our house. We have this dimension that's created to be bliss or hell, heaven or hell. We've had the hell aspect of it to overwhelm us and take us over. It does it in all of the things of, of the life that we do. Why? Because life is so filled with sensation. Every one of us, we, I mean, we've had to, I'm talking to myself, every day I have an opportunity to get stressed out. I do. Every day. What happens to me if I come under the weight of that stress? I, I don't want to come under the weight of that stress. Why? Because it's destroying this body temple. Doing everything it can to destroy this body. It's doing everything it can to throw this body temple away from its potentiality. What is that? It's that potentiality is for me to be the king of my castle. For me to be the, the master of my slave, which is my body. My body is designed to be my slave, not my master. But what is our body? It rules us because it tries to master and lord over us. And, and that, again, that's, that's a part of what we have to do, growing and becoming the master of our house. So, um, go with me to a place in the, uh, the New Testament. Let me see, I've got several places. Well, actually, just, just go over there to the book of Proverbs. I think that's where I'm going to wind up taking us here in just a minute. And... Uh, I want you to see something here about this. Um, something I was going to say, and, and I'm just pr I'm prodded to say it because of that passage I just read there in Genesis 6. I'm trying to stay away from doing an exegesis on the book of Genesis chapter 6, and I'm having a hard time doing that because it's so grossly mistranslated. And, and every one of us have been taught the story of Noah. You don't have to go to church to learn the story of Noah and the flood. Everybody in America knows the story of Noah and the flood. It's just, it's just ingrained. It's, it's, in, uh, it's just in the air you breathe. And everybody's like, well, you know, one day here, God just got mad, just really mad. I mean, he was really, really outright ranking everybody except for one family. He said, I'm going to gather all these together and I'm going to kill everybody else. Now, you know, the whole concept behind that kind of a understanding of this story is, is really ridiculous to say that this thing we call God this creature we call God because we don't get it right. He says, the hell with all of you. I'm going to drown you. That's what he get rid of. Drown. He did. He drowned us in this body. He drowned himself with us in this body. You see, this body is the deluge. This body is the water. This is, the, this is what we are drowning in. And when you look at this verse right here, this verse is really more powerful than you realize 
the waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. And it's not really a destruction of the flesh. It's where it comes to overwhelm the flesh. And you've got to realize your flesh, my flesh, overwhelms me. It overwhelms me by its addictions, by its appetites, by its desires, by its by its by its by its by, its, by its, it's just always biting at something. Mine is, not, not maybe yours, but mine is. <coughs> Destroy all flesh wherein is the the ruach, the spirit, the breath of life, the breath of God from under the heavens. Everything that is in the earth shall what? Shall die. Everything that's in the earth shall die. You know, that's really a gross error of the word. Let me just mention this to you. The word die, what do you think of when you think die? When you read that word, what is your idea, your opinion of die? To exist. To, to not exist, to, to die. <laughs> no longer be. Well, that word that, that we would use to, to kill, you think of die, to kill? Uh, you think of die to uh, uh, to body destroy, rot, to die? Yeah, that's what. You, that's the Hebrew word muth. That Hebrew word muth. It's used about two hundred and twenty times for the word die. Yet this particular word that you see right here is only used five times in the Old Testament, and it ain't the word muth. So why would they take a word that means to destroy or to kill? Why would they take that word and, you, and put the word die because that word right there, die, don't mean to destroy or to kill. It's actually the word gava. Gava. Now you hear the difference? Move. A little bit. Yeah. Move. Used 227 times. Or so, right about that many times. Gava. Used five times for the word die. And you know what it means? It means to breathe out. That's all it means. Mm -hmm. To breathe out. Now, when God enters, Ruach enters through the inhalation of your life. Well, for you to respond back to that, what have you got to do? Breathe out. So what are you doing? You're inhaling. That's the word he just used. The breath of life. Well in that inhale that must follow an exhale. To an expiration. You have to push it back out. That's how you live in this dimension. Is through that friction. And that's not dying. If it was, you would be living and dying all the time. Okay? Now, you know, that's just one little small example about how we say, we see words here, and if we do, if we don't know what we are reading, or if we haven't been taught, it ain't nobody's fault. See, what I'm saying is not anybody's fault. I, you can't blame the Baptist church down on the corner. It ain't their fault. You can't blame anybody. You can't blame your mom and daddy, grandma and grandpa. It can't, you can't blame your teachers or not. It ain't nobody's fault. It ain't even our fault. It's just that we have been dumbed down. We have been kept in bondage on purpose. And the purpose is when you find the truth, when you find your truth, you know what your truth will do for you? Your truth will make you free. And then when you begin to get free, it's just like I heard Wim Hof on one of his say, he said that what he wants to do is he wants to teach everybody in the world this breathing technique so that they can own their own mind. And I thought, wow, when I heard him say, man, that is the, that's, that's the epitome of the truth is for me to own my own mind, to me to own my own self. Well, you know what society tries to do? You know what religion wants you to do? Religion don't want you to own your mind. Religion wants you to believe what they tell you and then them own your mind. Your own physical body does that to us. Huh? Mine does. I'm talking about yours. I'm talking about mine. My own body tries to deceive me. It tries to trick me. It tries to, you know, we're talking about what the health, you know. Uh, 
you know, I've told a lot of people, you ought to watch that. You know, if you watch anything, you ought to watch that. What the hell? Well, is it going to make me have to change some things? I don't know. That's your choice. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want to change anything, okay, that's fine. Don't get brought under bondage. You see what I'm saying? Don't get brought under bondage because uh, somebody is, is offering, offering you something. If somebody's offering you something that could serve you, that could actually enhance your life, it would be advantageous for you to take it. <laughs> Especially if they're giving it away. It's free. <laughs> Here, I'm going to give you a million dollars. But it's an information. Oh, I've got to hell with that. I wanted money. <laughs> it's the most valuable thing you can ever have. So that's, oh, my goodness. Uh, let me read you some of the notes that I wrote. Moving on here if I can find them. <laughs> Good gracious. Uh, all life, while in manifestation, is tested, proved, and tried. It's tested, it's proved, and it's tried. <laughs> now I want you to hear that. I, I didn't say tempted. I said all life is tested. Well, if you if if I put a water line from the road up to here, I've got 600 feet of water line right here, and I put that together in 12 foot sections. Do you know what the smartest thing I could do before I buried my pipe? What would be the smartest thing to do? Try it. Test it. it. <laughs> Test it. Try it. Prove it. I'm gonna prove that it won't leak. Could it? Well, sure it could. But how am I going to know? I ain't going to know until it's proved, until it's tested. Well, in Genesis chapter 2, we said, in chapter 3, we said, well, the serpent tested Eve. The serpent is a symbol of the divine source itself, the divine breath, God itself. Tempted Eve is a totally misunderstanding of the whole analogy of that story. It proved it. Why did it prove it? It proved that truly what God built was like God itself. Did he not say in Genesis 1, 26, I will make humankind in or as my image. Make it as myself. So that it should be as I am. What's wrong with that? Then we have the, the mythological story of the character of Jesus and that story, Jesus said, it's not me doing this. It's what? It's the source. It's the Father. It's the power within me. It's doing this. And we have got to come to that same place if we realize that same thing. So all life, while in manifestation, is tested, it's proved, and it's tried. And hear, about, hear this part. Here's the place that is tested and proved and tried. Let me put the cardinal cross, the astrological wheel, and, and I'm going to put this right here, this symbol right here. And what is this symbol? Libra. Is that, is that correct? Is that kind of how it looks? Something like that, and that what they call. And what do they call this? They call this the scales, right? And that what they call it? The scales. And here's where we really have allowed a lie to trap us. They call it the scales of justice, but really it's not that. It's the scales of balance. Why? You know what this is? This is actually the pelvic. If you look at the astrological Adam Kidmon, which is called the God Man in the Sky, this is you, this is a baby, that's his head in the womb of your mama, this is your shoulders, your arms in the womb of your mama, and you come around. And in, in, in astrology, that's exactly what this is this is the round, the head. This is Taurus, the shoulders, the bull, the strength, the neck. This is Gemini, the twins, the two arms. They're identical. They mirror each other. Have you ever noticed that? They're not alike. They mirror. 
You see, when you look at yourself in the mirror, you see it's opposite. See? Let me marry each other. Look at there. My thumb's on the top. My thumb's on top. Well, it's a mirror. See, you cut right down the middle. That's, you, you see, you're God bifurcated. Your God is split in two. That, I mean, it, it, God is one, but God splits you in two. Why well, He married you? <coughs> Matter of fact, you can see when a woman is full term, you can see a crease that actually goes right up through there where her body. And we're all done, done that way. We've got a crease that runs right up through there. We can't see it. So you come on around through here, there's a little, there's a little baby in the womb. You've got, uh, you got the pelvic right here, right here. So what happens at the pelvic? The pelvic is where you're balanced. That's where you learn to walk. And so instead of Libra being the scales of justice, that's how it's been now. Justice system, bless God, you're right or wrong. You're never right or wrong. Could be out of balance. I mean, maybe, do you have something out of balance in your life? I do. Well, is that wrong? Could be for my greater good if I could just pay attention to it and tweak it just a little bit. Right? I mean, so see, balance is not wrong. But to get something in balance is where it works. You can take a motor and you put that motor together and put that motor uh, out of balance. You get the flywheel on it out of balance. You get the crankshaft on it out of balance. You know what that motor going to do? That's how most of our lives are going. <laughs> out of balance. That's not wrong. It's just bringing it back into balance. Bringing the scales back how do you do that? You do it by proving it. By testing it. You're going to know. You're going to make it. You're going to fine-tune it. You're going to tweak it so that it will work. In ancient astrology, this was expressed by the sign of Libra. The place between, the place right here, look at here. Sun rises. Look here. The sun rises. In the morning. And the sun goes over here, and the sun sets at Libra. It's where you balance light and dark. Did you know you have to do that? If you don't balance light and dark? In other words, if you don't get enough rest, sleep, Go with this up here, what happens? What happens to you? You're going to get sick? You're going to get completely out of bounds? Your life's going to, you're going to have stress. All these problems. Who did that to you? Everybody's saying nobody. Yeah, nobody. Nobody. You did it to yourself. I did it to me. I did it to myself. It's the place between light and dark. Light and dark. It's the place of the sea. This is where, this is, this is, where the seed is planted, right? This is where the seed is grown. This is where the seed is matured. July, August. And what happens in July and August? What do you do? You collect the seed. Why? Because you take your seed into the darkness of the womb and you create new life. And where does it come out? It comes out in the spring. In the light. In the sun. So, this whole cycle, this whole thing is placed between light and darkness. That's what you've got to balance. You have to balance the things in your life. When we are excessive, one side of our life, it will begin to show. It'll take you some time, but it'll show up. It will, it'll begin to crop up in your life. It really will. So, it places the seed, but harvest seed, the balance is the male. I mean, the seed is the male. The place where the, uh, the tomb or the womb this is the place right here of the, of the testicles or the ovaries when they work together. And what happens if the tes testicles and the ovaries, if they work together, what do they do? Create life. It's the cycle of God. They create humankind. They create every one of us. So the ancient astrology expressed the same idea that by the means of the sign of Libra balance. All life is eternal while in manifestation being tried in the balance. It can, so to say, stand or learn to walk at this point. It can stand and be localized as an existent thing when it is held firmly in the immovable status between the two equal balanced opposite poles or pulls. It stands at the neutral point of this tension. Okay. 
I wanted you to, uh, gosh, I'm pressing on my time here. I want you to uh, go with me to uh, the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs. Find that right, in the, right there next to Psalms. Psalms and then Proverbs. Go through quite a few, quite a few things here. Where are you at in Proverbs? Proverbs. Uh, I'm going to start in Proverbs chapter one. We'll go through several verses, and then I actually, I'm going to look at several passages of scripture in, in the Old Testament that's around there. So, you, like I said, if you got your finger in the index, hold it there, so you can go back and forth. So, I'm going to look in the book of Isaiah. I'm going to look in the book of Hosea. So several things, and you know I like to do that here to be ready and get get done here. Okay, uh, there's always been and always will be a need. Always been, always will be a need. And I'm gonna talk about that need in just a minute because that need's been perverted. That need has been. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It has been preyed upon. It has been abused. It has been used. And you won't live in this dimension without that need. That's a vital need that you have in this dimension. I'm going to tell you what it is here in just a few minutes. And I don't care who you are, where you're born, and what time or when. Whether you're living right now in this, in this marvelous time we are in, or you lived thousands of years ago, or you live thousands of years in the future, it doesn't matter. You're still, in this dimension, you're going, to find, you're going to find yourself facing this particular need. And so, I, I wrote this. Uh, I'll just read it to you. This is a teaching I did a month or two, three months back on Galatians chapter 4 about being under bondage. To be in this realm, we are under a certain bondage, like a weight, but we're not designed to be under that bondage. We're designed to be over that bondage. So that that bondage don't control me, I control it. But 99.9% .9 of all humanity are under that bondage, and it controls them. It controls us as humankind. But our design is... For us to be above it. Not to, not to do away with it because it is that bondage that creates the contrast of this dimension. And that bondage here is called cold and hot. <coughs> it's called health and sickness. It's called, it's called rich and poor. And, hell, can I elaborate on that? You, you see what I'm saying? I mean, do we get trapped under poverty? Yeah. We're not born to be under, we're born to be wealthy. We're, what is wealth? Wealth is not necessarily having billions and billions of dollars. Wealth is being able to have health, have freedom, have an ability. I mean, that's wealth. That we are designed to be that way. We're designed to be rich, not poor. We're designed to be well, not sick. We're built that way. But we find the greater part of the whole society is in poverty. Dear God, there are people starving to death literally on this planet by the millions. Isn't that ridiculous? You can't even fathom that. I noticed that uh, they posted something. I saw this about one, one of the first trillionaires. You understand what a trillion is? Dear God, a trillionaire has enough money to make every person on the earth become a millionaire. I mean, you know, with, with what, seven billion people, a trillionaire himself can make everybody on the earth a millionaire. That's just totally unfathomable. Right. Yet this earth is just integrated with all kinds of issues and problems. Why? We're under bondage. To be under bondage to the elements or to be under the influence of the physical body, the Greek word for body is slave. And it's the same word without with just different vowel points. Did you hear what I just said? The word body, the word slave in Greek is exactly the same word. One of them is the word soma, the other one is the word sema. Same identical word. All they do is change the vowel points. 
So is the body the slave or the, is the slave the body? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's the same word. The body being designed by the divine instructions to be the instrument of its, in other words, it being source, universe, God, it's designed to be God's body. Your body is designed to be God's body. It was built that way. It is that way. It's designed to be that way. It's to be, it's to be and it is, God's temple, God's house, God's living place. Why would God build a house and not move in? Would that be dumb? How many of you would do that? How many of y'all would build a mansion and not move in it? I hope you would. <laughs> if you would, we need to talk. Because you need some real serious counsel. <laughs> You're not going to build a mansion and not move in it. The experience, this experience uh, of God has all kinds of experiences. Good, bad, bliss, pain. Uh, Romans 8 refers to this pain as suffering. Any of you suffering? Could be right now. Could be psychologically suffering. That's one of the worst kinds of suffering that we have is psychological suffering. Your brain ever, has your brain ever wore you out and wouldn't quit? You ever had things that just kept you in the ditch thoughts that just keep weighing you down? I have. I have things that just constantly, I just have to bless God. You know, talking tongues to it or something. Um. Uh, Good, bad, bliss, pain, so forth. Suffering and discipline have two singularities. They can both bring positive results. You know what? I see a lot of people who finally get tired, and here's, what, here's a good old southern term, I think. They finally get sick and tired of being sick and tired. What does that mean? I've been suffering long enough, bless God. Situation's got to change. But what do we do? Well, bless God, we got inspired today. I'm going to change it today. What about tomorrow? Ah, oh, it's too hard. I don't know. It's a different day now. And what I'm going to do? Bring myself right back under the same, pardon the expression, crap. Do we not? I do. I'm talking to me. Talking to me. The greater, here, and here's what happens, and I want you to try to get a picture of this. The greater is ruled by the lesser. The greater is ruled by the lesser. What does that mean? It means this. God deposited Himself, Himself, into yourself to serve you either in your pain, and He can, make your, he can help you make your pain worse, or He can empower you and help you rise above your pain. Doesn't mind. God is there. So the greater is in the lesser, the physical, to serve it. Not to usurp authority over it. See, we think, well, God, if you're all powerful, why don't you come down here and quit having these babies get raped? Quit having these people starve to death and get. If you all that great, why don't you come down here and do something? He said, I did. I mean, you do it. Why don't you do it? Oh, changes the story. The greater is ruled by the lesser. Why? Because the greater, which is the divine spirit, the essence, the power, does not rule over. It is the servant of the house. It does not rule you by conquest or by battle. God's not in, he's not in a struggle with you. He's not in a war with you. God is just simply there to serve you and to love you. He doesn't do it by conquest or by battle. He serves you through and by love. And that love is unconditional, so there's not any conditions on it. That love doesn't say, well, if you're going to do that, I'm not going to be with you no more. <laughs> If you're going to act like that, I'm going to leave. Well, God, I hope you don't, because if you do, I'm going to be, I ain't going to be nothing to be served anyway, because there ain't going to be no life in this temple. This is going to be dead anyway if you leave. He said, I will not fight for leadership. We must follow love through surrender. Hmm. I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior. Savior. Savior, what does that mean? To save you from you. <laughs> we must follow through surrender. We yield to God's leadership. He never takes or He never makes you and I follow Him. So what am I saying? I am saying that it's nobody's fault. 
in a way to blame, but yet we struggle through these things of suffering and pain. See, that's almost rhymes. You know, I could almost make a song out of that. Somebody could make a song out of that. Uh, so I can't point my finger other than the fact that when I point that one, all them others is back at the real source, which is me. Because it's me. You know, you know, you just have to touch yourself and you have to say, it's me. It's me. I, I either will or I won't. It ain't that I can or can't. I can. I can. You can, I can. However, there is something that we all desperately need. Genesis, I mean, Proverbs, you found it there. I'm going to try to wind up down here real quick. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. The fear, that's a bad word for translators. It should have been respect or to revere. You see, if you respect me, you're not afraid of me. If you respect me, you will you'll, you'll acknowledge me. You won't ignore me. If you respect me, you'll acknowledge me. What does that mean? It, it mean it, you'll listen to me. Could be that I would have something that I could share with you. Maybe not. Could be. But if you respect me, you'll listen. So instead of putting fear, because that's what religion wants you to do, they want you to be afraid of this terrible mean God because they have they have this ace, they have this card over you, they're going to hold this card, this joker card. And that joker card is a concept that they created called hell. And if you don't do what God's wanting you to do, bless He's going to burn you forever and ever and ever. And the pain of that is it's not even imaginable. It's more than you can even imagine. If you ever heard somebody screaming and crying and begging that's in a fire that wants to get out, they hold that over us. It's not true. God doesn't do that. So you, so you don't need to be afraid. The fear of the Lord God is the beginning of what? Knowledge. Everybody say knowledge. Knowledge. Knowledge is the key thing. Knowledge is key. If you don't have knowledge, that word knowledge in Hebrew is this word right here. Uh, I'll do this real small. And I'll tell you what this is. This is the Kabbalistic tree of life. This and this are exactly the same thing. This is called the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. And this, this little thing right here in the middle, this, this little circle that I dotted, the reason I did that is because in, in reality, this is not there, but in reality, this is there. See, it would be like if I could if I could cut a door open right here and I can step through this door over here into God. This is true. Or if I can understand this door is a door God can step over into me. See, it, it doesn't literally exist, but literally it does exist. Do you understand that? Can you get that? And here's what that door is. This door right here is called in Hebrew use that way. I'm going to put it back up there so that you can understand. In Hebrew it's called D-A-A-T-H. Deot. And that word deot is that word right there that you just read. Verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of deot. Knowledge. Knowledge. Knowledge will set you free. Knowledge will empower you. Everything in this world system tries to keep you and me ignorant, not knowing. Because if you don't know, I can empower myself over you if I do know. If I can keep you ignorant, and that's what happens to most of us is we are kept dumb down. And that's just the beginning of that word. That word is used all over this book. This word they are. And it has nothing to do with anything special in, in the natural world. In other words, it doesn't have anything to do with reading a thousand books a year. Even though it's good if you can read a thousand books a year and gain knowledge. We have one place in the Bible, one passage of Scripture that is, that is attributed to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians that says knowledge puffs up. 
It's a total misunderstanding of the use of the word knowledge. Complete. Because without knowledge, there is no wisdom. Without knowledge, there is no understanding. And in this realm, we need wisdom and understanding. And it comes through day off. It comes through that open window. When you can find that open window, I'm telling you, if you meditate, if you'll take time every day, 15 minutes every morning, if you set aside 15 minutes and you'll quieten your mind and you'll meditate, you will cross this, this threshold, this door, this window of day off. And you can receive a download of knowledge of God. Two passages, and I won't quit this morning. Okay, Isaiah, just real quickly, flip over to the book of Isaiah. You're there in Proverbs, and just keep turning over just a bit. That's a book or two over, and you'll see Isaiah just next door to Proverbs. Okay? That little book is here in our Ecclesiastes. Isaiah chapter 5. Just find that real quickly. Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 13. Everybody found it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity. That word captivity is the Hebrew word galah. And it actually means to be stripped. To be stripped. And what happens if they strip you down? If they if to be stripped, in other words, it means to de be denuded, or if you're denuded. If you're a man and you're denuded, what does that mean? You can't produce. You can't produce. You know, that's not a good, that's not a good thing. <laughs> that's what that word means. So notice it says, My people are gone into captivity. In other words, they did it to set itself. They went into it. We did. How come? They went into it. Because, why did they do it? Because what? They have no knowledge. They have no doubt. They don't have a window. They don't have a place where they find out who they are. They don't have knowledge. So what, what the lack of knowledge will bring you into what? Captivity. It'll bring you to a place to be denuded. Now go with me to Hosea. Hosea. It's just, that's what the little mind was over there before you get to the book of Matthew. No, Matthew in the New Testament went way too far. So Hosea. Hosea. King James Bible is on page, I mean, date, it's on page 884 in the day. Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. Find it. Verse 6. Verse 6. My people are destroyed. This word destroyed is actually the word dama. And it actually means to be silent, to be dumb, to be cut down, or to be a failure. Why? Why are they? Why are they silent? Why are they dumbed down? Or why are they a failure? My people are destroyed for the lack of what? Knowledge. They are the same thing. Because they haven't found that place. And in that place, all you're going to find in that place, you're going to find your true being. You're going to find who you really are. And when you find out who you really are, who you really are is powerful. Who you really are is passionate. Who you really are will begin to take charge of a life that's not <coughs> passionate, that's not powerful. <coughs> Who you really are because you really are soul, spirit in a body. That's who you really are. You are a divine, powerful being in a physical body. And you're in this physical body for this body to serve you, not rule over you, not to be your master. You and I desire to be its master. But knowledge will teach us how. So we come down here, this should be a school. And right above our door, it should say the same thing that all of the ancient schools said. Man, know yourself, and you will know God. That's what the schools taught. To the church, it, the whole idea, they've taken the, they taken the whole concept and the, the major tool that we need to bring us from where we are under bondage to where we could be in freedom is called redemption, restoration, 
and salvation. They've taken those things and they've used them over us in a negative way when those are the most positive things that we can have. What is redemption? It's redeeming me, redeeming myself from myself. It's bringing myself back into the power that I truly have. That's what redemption is, is to redeem me. Restoration is to bring me back up from all of the things that have destroyed me and held me down. Salvation is to connect, the, the real meaning of the word is to connect my upper heaven to my lower heaven and make me one whole. But we haven't heard that. We haven't been taught that. But we are being taught that. So, so that we can empower ourselves and become the powerful creatures that God built us to be. Amen. Amen. Any questions? That makes any sense?